Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today, today's topic is John Tyler, uh, part one. John Tyler was the tenth president of the United States of America. He's he he became president in April of 1841. Uh, served. He was part of the Tippecanoe and Tyler II campaign, vice president of William Henry Harrison. And when Harrison died, only a month into his term, uh, Tyler became president and served for the remaining three years and 11 months of uh, William Henry Harrison's term. So he was president from 18, April of 1841 until March of 1845. John Tyler was an Episcopalian. He went to college at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. He was married twice. Uh, his first wife, Letitia, died when he was president in the White House. And then he remarried while he was president. His second wife's name was Julia. He fathered 16 children, the most of any president, nine from his first wife, Letitia, and seven from Julia. Tyler was the sixth of eight Virginia-born presidents, and Virginia remained his, his home for his, for his entire life. His father was the governor of Virginia, and his father was, the, was a friend and college roommate of Thomas Jefferson. John Tyler, Tyler was called the traitor president for his support of the Confederacy uh, before the Civil War and, and in the early parts of the Civil War until he died. He was also called his accidency because his presidency was, was an accident, you could say, based on the death of William Henry Harrison. John Tyler played a major role in Hawaii and te Texas becoming parts of the United States. He was tall and slender and had a patrician's Roman nose. He was friends with Dolly Madison. Uh, John Tyler was an intellectual. He loved books and had 1,200 books in his library at, at his death. William Shakespeare was his first love, and he, and he loved to quote Shakespeare. He was very interested in geography, discovery, science, and technology. Uh, Tyler was the first vice president to become president after the death of the president. At age 51, he was the youngest president at that time. Uh, strangely, uh, he had no vice president. They, they, didn't, uh, they didn't make that arrangement, so he, he served as president without a vice president. In 2019, uh, Tyler had two living grandsons. They, so this is just this past year, I think still now. And uh, so he's the earliest uh, president who have living grandchildren. His grandson, Harrison Tyler, maintains the family home at the Sherwood Forest Plantation in Charles City County, Virginia. John Tyler was uh, born on March 29, 1790, in Charles City County, Virginia. Uh, he was the sixth of eight children and the second son. Uh, he was born in the same county as William Henry Harrison, who was his running mate in 1840. Of course, Harrison really had made Ohio his home. Uh, John Tyler's father was a planter, politician, Virginia governor uh, the, on the Greenway Plantation. His father was, had some famous friends, including Patrick Henry and James Monroe and Thomas Jefferson. On the family uh, plantation, they grew wheat, corn, to, and tobacco. John T Tyler developed a love of music, poetry, and literature. Tragically, his mother died in 1797 when Tyler was only seven years old, so he lost his mom at a very young age. By, by 1807, uh, Tyler had graduated from the College of William, William and Mary. He was only 17. <laughs> And uh, after college, he studied law with his father. He studied to be a lawyer. He loved, and again, he, he was an intellectual. He loved ancient history and uh, Shakespeare. He loved to quote the bard, Shake, William Shakespeare, especially courting women. At that time, they called the College of William and Mary the alma mater to the nation because of so many uh, uh, power, important uh, people in the early days of American history who had studied there. Same year was uh, John Tyler, well, as a college student, he liked Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, which is a pro-capitalism book. He memorized passages, which he included in his presidential speeches. 
By 1809, Tyler was admitted to the Virginia Bar to practice law in Virginia. And he, he worked as a lawyer in the prestigious Richmond law firm headed by the former U.S. Attorney General Edmund Randolph. One notable case, the opposing lawyer in this uh, courtroom case used English law as a legal precedent, and Tyler responded, quote, Our late war was fought in the face of this English authority, which sought to make slaves of our seamen and destroy the independence of our country. Sir, this jury will have none of your English authority. Away with it. By 1811, uh, Tyler had been elected to the Virginia legislature, where he served for the next five years. He was very likable. People like John Tyler, good fellow. By 1813, he married Letitia Christian on his 23rd birthday. They had nine children. They were married for 32 years. And that same year, his father died. He inherited the family property and 13 slaves. The War of 1812 was on, and Tyler was captain of the militia uh, for, a, for a brief period of time during the War of 1812. By 1816, he had been elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Virginia, only 26 years old. Well, he loved playing the violin and writing poetry. He was very impressed as a young fellow with Henry Clay and said this about, about Clay, quote, Had he lived in the time of Pericles his name would have found a place of high eminence in in Athenian history. By 1821, Tyler, who had health trouble his his entire life, he was having having health trouble and financial problems, and he retired from Congress, returned to his home in Virginia. By 1823, he was back in politics uh, in the Virginia legislature, served for two years there. Now, slavery was an ongoing uh, conflict, which, of course, eventually led to the Civil War. And Tyler, during this time, had this to say about slavery, quote, What enabled New York, Pennsylvania, and other states to adopt the language of universal emancipation? Nothing but the paucity of the number of their slaves. That which would have been criminal in those states not to have done would be an act of political suicide in Georgia or South Carolina to do. Yeah, so the North never had large numbers of slaves, and eventually they did outlaw, each of the states outlawed slavery. However, the South had such large numbers that uh, folks in the South, uh, white folks, European descent folks, uh, were, were, were scared of the consequences of freeing slaves and slaves seeking revenge and slaves having power uh, over uh, whites in the South. 1825, John Tyler was elected governor of Virginia, served for two years, and he, uh, during, the, during his time, Thomas Jefferson died, and, and Governor Tyler gave the funeral oration in 1826 for Thomas Jefferson, quote, When the happy era shall arrive for the emancipation of nations, hastened on as it will be by the example of America, shall they not resort to the declaration of our independence as the charter of their rights? And will not its author be hailed as the benefactor of the redeemed? Thomas Jefferson was Tyler, John Tyler's inspiration. By 1827, Tyler had been elected to the U.S. Senate from Virginia and served in that capacity for the next nine years. In 1832, John Tyler said, quote, My imagination has led me to look into the distant future and there to contemplate the greatness of free America. I have beheld her walking on the waves of the mighty deep, carrying along with her tidings of great joy to distant nations. I have seen her overturning the strong places of despotism and restoring to man his long-lost rights. You see, Tyler had a tremendous faith in the United States, and America's role, positive role in, in world history and for other countries as well. 1833, uh, uh, now, backing up, jo- John Tyler had supported uh, President uh, An- or supported Andrew Jackson in the 1828 and 1832 elections. However, there was, uh, again, growing conflict between uh, the southern states and the federal government because of the tariff and slavery. And then they, they, so there was this idea in the South that they, especially the, the tariff law was, uh, was hurting the southern states. They were paying more for imports. It protected northern imports. So they came up with the idea of nullification. And 
that the southern states had the right to nullify federal law. And uh, John Tyler broke with Andrew Jackson over this issue. He supported nullification. He voted with the major senators to censure, an- censure Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson, for his withdrawal of federal deposits in the bank war. And people took sides in the bank war when Andrew Jackson decided to, to end it. And uh, so anyway, he... Uh, uh, John Tyler wanted up being an opponent of Andrew Jackson. 1835, there was a the abolition movement was growing stronger and stronger in the North. Folks fighting to end slavery. There was a backlash against the abolitionist movement in the North and the South. It was more violent in the North. Uh, abolitionist speakers were verbally harassed and pelted with eggs and rocks, threatened with bodily harm. In October of 1835, mobs in Boston dragged William Lloyd Garrison through the streets with a rope around his neck. Garrison was a strong abolitionist supporter. In 1836, uh, John Tyler was pressured to vote to expunge, expunge the censure of Andrew Jackson. By the, he was pressured by the Virginia legislature who supported that. However, he refused and then he re- ended up resigning from the Senate, and uh, strangely enough, uh, uh, he became the Whig candidate for vice president in 1836 and did well in the election. Again, slavery was growing more and more controversial. John Tyler owned several hundred slaves. Lydia Maria Child wrote this about the black slaves in Washington, D.C., quote, Whole coffles of them, chained and manacled, are driven through our capital on their way to auction. Foreigners, particularly those who come here with enthusiastic ideas of American freedom, are amazed and disgusted by the sight. A troop of slaves once passed through Washington on the 4th of July while drums were beating and standards flying. One of the captive Negroes raised his hand, loaded with irons, and waved it toward the starry flag, and sang with a smile of bitter irony, Hail Columbia, happy land. John Tyler never freed any any of his slaves. To do so would have been political suicide. By 1838, Tyler had been elected to the Virginia legislature, and he was elected as a Whig. By this time, he had switched parties. The issue, his severe conflict with President Andrew Jackson led him to leaving the Democratic Party and joining the Whig Party. 1840, he was picked as the vice presidential uh, running mate for William Henry Harrison by the Whig Party. So it was William Henry Harrison and John Tyler. Of course, uh, Harrison's... uh, Nickname was Tippy Canoe, and the his campaign slogan was Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. There were plenty of songs. A really fun campaign. One of the lyrics from the from a campaign song went like this: "Quote, we shall vote for Tyler, therefore, without a why or wherefore." <clears throat> John Tyler was elected vice president in the in the 1840 election, along with uh, his his running mate William Henry Harrison. They they they, they won the election. Although uh, Martin Van Buren won Virginia, so Tyler wasn't able to help Harrison carry his home state. Uh, Richmond, uh, the Richmond Inquirer newspaper recorded, quote, The Goths may have taken Rome, but the Citadel was saved. So the, uh, anyway, the Tippecanoe and Tyler, too. So by March of 1841, uh, William Henry Harrison was inaugurated, and John Tyler didn't believe he had anything to do as vice president, so he had gone home to his home in Williamsburg when he learned about the death of William, President Harrison in April of 1841. So he traveled to Washington because uh, he, was, uh, he, was, he was going to assume the presidency as the vice president, and he was determined that he would not be a weak president. He was being, he faced immediate pressure uh, by his cabinet, well, the cabinet of Harrison that he had inherited, where they, he was told that uh, the decisions would be made by a, ma- a majority vote of the cabinet. 
And, and he said, no, that's not how it's going to be. He said, quote, I can never consent to being dictated to. So he said, well, I'm going to make decisions. You guys can give me advice. But he would not accept that idea. That He was being pressured to be a weak, weak president by Henry Clay. One historian wrote, quote, John Tyler's whole course of conduct in the first few days after he arrived in the Capitol demonstrated plainly that he acted with conscious deliberation to establish himself as a president in his own right and not as a mere caretaker for the departed Harrison. April 6, 1841, John Tyler became the 10th U.S. president. He, he, again, he finished the term, almost the entire term, three years and 11 months of William Henry Harrison's term, term. Tyler was sworn in at Brown's Hotel in Washington on 6th Street and Pennsylvania Af Avenue two days after President Harrison's death. And there was kind of some confusion. Some called him the acting presidency. And then he was being, there was people who mocked him, called him his accidency. And uh, now he returned mail that, to him that, that, were, that, that was written, the acting president because he affirmed that he was the president, not just the acting president, not some type of lesser president or weaker. Now, this led to immediate conflict with the Whig Party, and he was disowned by the Whig Party. So he became a, he, he was kicked out of the Whig Party, and the president had no political party. John Tyler had this to say about the presidency. He called it, quote, a bed of thorns, which has afforded me no repose. At his first cabinet meeting, he said this, quote, I am very glad to have in my cabinet such able statesmen as you, but I can never consent to being dictated to as to what I shall or shall not do. I am the president. When you think otherwise, your resignation will be accepted. One of his friends had this to say about John Tyler, quote, When he thinks he is right, he is, he is obstinate as a bull, and no power on earth can move him. John Tyler established that upon the death of the president, the vice president becomes the president. Now, the Constitution was ambiguous, and uh, it was only in the, the 25th Amendment, which was passed in to the Constitution, was passed in 1967, which clarified the issue. Of course, and there were a number of, before, there, before, before that, a number of presidents died in office, including Abraham Lincoln, uh, um, James A. Garfield, William McKinley, and so forth. And, so, and then in, in those cases, the vice president became the president. They were, they were following. The, Tyler set the, this was the first time this had happened, and he, he established the precedent that the vice president would become the president with full power, be a regular president. Now, after the death of Harrison, backing up a little bit, there was, it was a 230-mile trip from Williamsburg to Washington, and he got there in 21 hours, which was fast for that time. He took a steamboat on the James River to, to Richmond, Virginia, and then a train to Washington. But upon becoming president, uh, early in his presidency, John Tyler said, quote, The death of our late patriotic president, while it has defo devolved upon me the high office of President of the United States, has occasioned me the deepest pain and anxiety. I am under providence made the instrument of a new test, which is, which is for the first time to be, to be applied to our institutions. The experiment is to be made at the moment when the country is agitated by conflicting views of public policy and when the spirit of faction is most likely to exist. Under these circumstances, the devolvement upon me of this high office is peculiar, peculiarly embarrassing." 1841, John, President John Tyler said this, quote, The Constitution never designed that the executive should be a mere cipher. And this is what the Whigs wanted, and especially Henry Clay wanted to be the real power. And he wanted to dominate. He, had, he was expecting to dominate William Henry Harrison, although he had immediate conflict with Harrison. Now he wanted to do the same thing with, uh, with Tyler, because Clay felt like he was the the man, he wanted to be the power, and Tyler said no. Um, they had this meeting in the White House between President Tyler and Henry Clay, and a, a major conflict, and Tyler said, quote, Go you now then, Mr. Clay, to your end of the avenue. He's talking about Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House and the Capitol. 
Go you now, Mr. Clay, to your end of the avenue, where stands the capital, and there perform your duty to your country, as you shall think proper. So help me, God, I shall do mine at this end as I see fit. So Major, he stood up to Henry Clay and said, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be your puppet. After being scolded by President Tyler, Silas Wright wrote about Henry Clay, quote, Henry Clay is unhappy and much more imperious and arrogant with his friends than I ever knew him, and that, you know, is saying a great deal. John Tyler brought some of his slaves to the White House, and northern visitors were shocked that the White House, Liberty's showcase, uh, when they came there, they were greeted by John Tyler's slave butler. Now, there were stories that uh, Tyler was accused of fathering children with slaves and then selling his children. Those are unconfirmed. Uh, Some black Americans today in Virginia believe they are descendants of John Tyler. During this time, Great Britain had uh, come out against slavery. Backing up during the American Revolution, the British recruited slaves for the British Army. They had the Ethiopian Regiment, and on their uniforms was the slogan, Liberty to Slaves. In the South, the abolition movement was seen as promoting slave rebellion, which was their biggest fear that the slaves would rise up and kill European descent Americans in the South. August of 1841, at 2 a.m., August 18th, there was a drunken mob at the White House, blowing horns, throwing rocks at the White House, firing guns, and they, were, they burned a scarecrow effigy of John Tyler because he had, uh, he had vetoed the establishment of the U.S. Bank. And, of course, he was, this mob had been organized by his en- political enemies, particularly those in the Whig Party and Henry Clay. September of 1841, his entire cabinet, except for Secretary of State Daniel Webster, resigned because of uh, Tyler had voted, uh, vetoed the establishment of a national bank. He was expelled from the Whig Party. So Tyler, President Tyler was a president without a party. November of that year, there was a ship named the Creole. It was transporting slaves from Virginia to New Orleans, and the slaves mutinied and took over the ship and sailed the ship to Nassau, Bahamas, off the coast of Florida, where they they became free. They were, at that time, the Bahamas was a British territory, and the British had outlawed slavery. So these slaves became free in the Bahamas, where they ended up living. And this, the news of this traveled, traveled in the U.S. American slaves were very excited. They thought, wow, if you can travel to a British territory, they, they could become free. The news spread like a contagion. The Creole Slave Rebellion was the most successful uh, slave rebellion, and of course with British help. There was a lot of anger in the South among European descent Americans. They wanted the slaves returned, and they wanted, they wanted compensation, but, and then President Tyler was blamed for this situation. 1841, uh, uh, the, the country of Haiti and the Caribbean, the, the western third of the island of Hispaniola was an independent country. And it was r- ruled by uh, African descent Haitians. Ha- Haiti had been Saint Domingue, French Saint Domingue, a French colony, and these slaves had re- revolted and become an independent country, and driven out the French, or the French either were killed or, or left. So Haiti was this independent country. Thomas Hart Benton wrote this about Haiti in 1841. Quote. We trade with her, but no diplomatic relations have been established between us. We purchase coffee from her and pay her for it, but we exchange no consuls or ministers. We receive no mulatto mulatto consuls or black ambassadors from her. Why does the United States refuse to recognize Haiti? Because the peace of 11 states to this union will not permit the fruits of a successful Negro insurrection to be exhibited among them. It will not permit black consuls and ambassadors to establish themselves in our cities and to parade through our country and give their fellow blacks in the United States proof in hand of the honors which await them for a like successful effort on their part. It will not permit the fact to be seen and told that from the murders of their masters and mistresses, they are to find friends among the white people of the United States. And the growing conflict over slavery... 
Henry Clay uh, said that the Democrats would the Democrats would give John Tyler, President Tyler, quote, lodgings in some outhouse, but they will never trust him. He will stand there like Benedict Arnold in England, a monument of his perfidy and disgrace. Like uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, John Tyler believed in U.S. territorial expansion for union and prosperity, and he was interested in Texas joining the United States. One of his accomplishments, uh, John T- President Tyler promoted a strong U.S. Navy. His sec- the Secretary of, Na- of the Navy was Abel Upshur, and Tyler believed that the, a strong U.S. Navy was important for American security and to extend American power in the Pacific Ocean. He believed there was a need for, for, for a naval bases in the Pacific area, especially Hawaii. And during this time, he was working to convert the U.S. Navy from sail to steam power and establish a naval academy. 1841, President Tyler said, quote, We hold out to the people of other countries an invitation to come and settle among us as members of our rapidly growing family. And for the blessings which we offer them, we require of them to look upon our country as their country and to unite with us in the great task of preserving our institutions and thereby perpetuating our liberties. Charles Dickens was a visitor to Washington in 1841, the famous author of books like David Copperfield and uh, A Tale of Two Cities, and Oliver Twist, and he, he had this to say about President Tyler, quote, He looked somewhat worn and anxious, and well he might, being at war with everybody. Yeah, John Tyler had been uh, switched parties from the Democrats to the Whigs and kicked out of the Whig party. In 1841, John President Tyler signed the Log Cabin Bill. An American settler could claim 160 acres of land before public sale and later pay $1.25 per acre. December 7, 1841, President Tyler sent his first message to Congress, quote, The United States cannot but take a deep interest in whatever relates to this young but growing Republic of Texas. Texas was an independent country at that time. It fought a war of independence against Mexico. Settled principally by emigrants from the United States, we have the happiness to know that the great principles of civil liberty are there destined to flourish under wise institutions and wholesome laws and that, through its example, another evidence is to be afforded of the capacity of popular institutions to advance the prosperity, happiness, and permanent glory of the human race. The great truth that government was made for the people, and not the people for the government, has already been established in the practice and by the example of these United States, and we can do no other than contemplate its further exemplification by a sister republic with the deepest interest." 1832, President Tyler signed a treaty with Great Britain, which resolved the uh, main United States and Canada border, so the border between the U.S. and Canada at Maine. They finally worked that out. This was a, he were, Tyler put a lot into this, and he did a lot. It was a big achievement. By 1842, there were 12,000 ex-American slaves living in Canada, especially the, the fugitives, well, they were... Eventually, the fugitive slave law was passed. They felt they, they had left the South and traveled North and, and were living in Canada. 1842, in January, his daughter Elizabeth got married. In September, his wife Letitia died. She'd been uh, in poor health and disabled since a stroke in 1839. She died at age 51. She never was able to serve as First Lady because of her poor health. In May of that year, John C. Fremont, also known as the Pathfinder, was exploring in the Rocky Mountains. Also, 1842, there was big excitement because Charles Wilkes was leading the U.S. exploring expedition in the Pacific Ocean. He explored Polynesia, Melanesia, and discovered Antarctica. Wilkes made detailed maps of the Pacific Islands, which were used in the Second World War really something. He mapped 800 miles of the Pacific coast of the U.S. in North America, including California and Oregon. He acquired many objects and artifacts, which became the core collection for the Smithsonian Institute. Really something. 
There was economic and religious uh, forces pressuring John Tyler, President Tyler, for a U.S. presence in Hawaii. The first American missionaries had come to Hawaii in 1819. It was called the Sandwich Islands at that time. Now, there was this distinct possibility that it could become a French territory. It was still, in, it was still independent. And the, the king of Hawaii, King Kamehameha III, wanted recognition of its independence. It wanted to preserve its independence. The other three countries were competing to take Hawaii, the U.S., U.K., and France. In 1842, Temoteo Halililio and William Richards were on a diplomatic mission from Hawaii to Washington, hoping for recognition of Hawaiian independence. Timoteo Halilitlio was a dark-skinned Hawaiian, and he became a popular celebrity in Washington, and met, he met with President Tyler. The United States recognized Hawaiian independence, but claimed, claimed it as an Amer- part of the American sphere of influence. President Tyler also, during this time, was promoting a diplomatic mission to China. And Daniel Webster got involved in that. Now, backing up, John, John Quincy Adams, who was former president, was still very active and was in Congress, and he supported uh, John President Tyler's Pacific agenda. Now, the British took over Hawaii in February of 1843. This was a disaster. They had taken New Zealand in 1841. The U.S. protested the British takeover of, uh, of, of Hawaii, and, and then because they, they said, well, we, need, we really need Hawaii as a stopover on crossing the Pacific Ocean for trade. And the British left Hawaii in July of 1843. So there's a lot of relief because of that. Well, that concludes today's presentation. We'll continue next time with John Tyler, Part 2. You might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. So far, we've made 580 history videos in seven areas, world history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. You also might consider checking out our podcast, Adventures in History, which you can listen to on Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.